watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Welcome to a very special edition of Jewish 101, a program for anyone who wants to understand more about Jewish in general, and especially the Jewish tradition. So let's talk about Hanukkah, which is fast approaching. I'm Mark Golub. It's wonderful to be with you again. Thank you for all your lovely notes and cards. But tonight, and this program, I want to talk about Hanukkah, which is one of the most misunderstood, even maligned, of Jewish holidays. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say that Hanukkah is really a minor, insignificant Jewish holiday, and has only become important in America because of its proximity in time to Christmas and the Christmas season. And that's only partially true. Hanukkah is technically a minor Jewish holiday. Why is it minor? Well, which book of the Torah, five books of Moses, tells the story of Hanukkah? Where would you find the story of Hanukkah in the Torah? And the answer is obviously nowhere. Since the Torah recounts what happened to the children of Israel from the time they left Egypt and through the 40 years of their wanderings before re-entering the promised land of Canaan, Eretz Yisrael. So clearly Hanukkah is not found anywhere in the Torah. And only the major holidays of the Jewish tradition are the ones mentioned in the Torah. Passover, Shavuot, Yom Hazikaron, the Day of Remembrance, which the rabbis rename Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, which ends with Shmini Atzeret. These are the only major Jewish holidays called festivals, and every festival mentioned in the Torah is celebrated in part by the commandment of not working. In the Torah, it's forbidden to work, not only on the Shabbat, but on all the other Jewish festivals. And a festival is called in Hebrew a Yom Tov, which literally means a good day, but which has come to mean a holiday. And the Yiddish term for a Yom Tov is Yontif. Yontif is Yiddish for a good day or a holiday, a holiday festival mentioned in the Torah. Many of you know the phrase Yontif. And even the phrase good Yontif, which is actually a sort of a redundancy, literally translated as good, good day. But in terms of what's meant by the phrase good Yontif, it's have a good or wonderful holiday. Anyway, only holidays mentioned in the Torah are major holidays or festivals in the Jewish tradition, and you can't work on those festivals. But what about holidays mentioned elsewhere in the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh? Where in the rest of the Tanakh, the rest of the Jewish Bible, can you find the holiday of Hanukkah? And the answer is nowhere. The holiday of Hanukkah is not included anywhere in the Jewish Bible. Rather, the holiday is mentioned in another set of books called the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha. And here is a copy of the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha is really derived from the Greek word for hidden or secret. And it suggests that the authorship of these books in the Apocrypha is in dispute, and that the facts are sometimes in dispute. And the Apocrypha includes books which were not included in the canon of the Jewish Bible, which scholars tend to believe was concluded in the second century CE. In the second century CE, the books of the Bible, the Jewish Bible, were put together. And some of the books of the Apocrypha include the Wisdom of Solomon, or the Book of Judith. 
And the two most important books in terms of the Jewish tradition found in the Apocrypha are the first and second books of Maccabees, which tell the story of Hanukkah. And so, to the extent that Hanukkah is not a major festival in the Torah, it is a minor Jewish holiday. Just as, for example, Purim is a minor Jewish holiday. Purim tells the story of Queen Esther and Mordechai saving the Jews of Persia from evil Haman, Haman. The Megillah Esther, the scroll of Esther, is also not in the Torah, not in the five books of Moses, though it is in the third section of the Jewish Bible. You will find in Kituvim, the writings, the Megillah, the scroll of Esther. But Purim and Hanukkah are both minor Jewish holidays. Why? Because they're not found in the Torah, the five books of Moses. And therefore, one is permitted to work on both Hanukkah and Purim. Though, women are exempt from all work while the candles of Hanukkah are burning in one's home. A little wrinkle most people don't know. Women are exempt from working while the Hanukkah candles burn in the home. And the reason being, one is not to use the candles of Hanukkah for any utilitarian purpose, such as giving light for someone to do work by. So as long as the Hanukkah candles burn, no one is permitted to work, especially mommies and grandmas. But if Hanukkah is a minor Jewish holiday because it's not in the Torah, it's not an unimportant Jewish holiday. Nor is Hanukkah's importance related in any way to its proximity on the calendar to the holiday of Christmas. For the truth is that the values and ideals of Hanukkah are some of the most important ideals the Jewish tradition has given to the world. And the American constitutional principle of religious freedom is a direct descendant of the principles and values that are at the heart of the holiday of Hanukkah. So let's do this. Let's take a look at the history of Hanukkah. Then we'll look at the story of Hanukkah, which is what most of us know from our childhoods. And then we'll take a look at the basic ways in which Hanukkah is celebrated in Jewish homes. First, the history of Hanukkah, which can be said to begin in the 4th century BCE, when a young king from Macedonia was said to have conquered the then known world. Alexander the Great was only 20 years old after the death of his father, Philip, and he began his conquest of the Persian Empire and Syria, Judea, and Egypt, and as far east as India. When Alexander conquered Judea in 333 BCE, he had a very benevolent policy towards the Jews. While he did tax Judea, he permitted the Jews to practice their Jewish tradition as they wished. And there's even evidence that for a period of an entire year, every Jewish family named any boy child Alexander. Unfortunately, Alexander was not to live long, and he died 10 years later at the age of 33. Upon his death, his generals divided his kingdom among themselves. The Ptolemies took Egypt to the south, there was the Macedonian kingdom to the north and west, which was Greece and would eventually become the Roman Empire. And then there was the Middle East, ruled by the Seleucid family, also known as the Syrians. They were all Greek Hellenists at the time, but the Seleucid family was also known as the Syrians. Now, the Syrian kings often went by the name of Antiochus, some of you may pronounce it Antiochus. Most of the time, the kingdoms that were divided out of Alexander's kingdom warred with each other, each trying to extend their respective control. And Judea was often caught in the middle and was ruled alternately by the Seleucids of Syria or the Ptolemies of Egypt. But then, in the second century BCE, Antiochus IV, 
who was also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, and Epiphanes means God incarnate. Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, determined that the most effective means of strengthening his entire empire would be to impose one cultural system on all the different groups. All the groups under his control would be one culture. And so he decided to Hellenize the Syrian Empire, to make all the different little cultural and ethnic groups under his control act and think the same way like Greeks, Hellenists. And this homogenization of his realm, he believed, would strengthen his kingdom, give it a solidarity, a unity, and give him an advantage in his battles with the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Greek Macedonians. And so in Judea, in the year 175 BCE, a horrible year in Jewish history, 175 BCE, Antiochus proclaimed that the practice of Judaism, Torah, would no longer be acceptable. And on a Shabbat, Antiochus entered Jerusalem, butchered Jews everywhere, took Jewish women and children to be sold as slaves, plundered Jerusalem, razed the city's walls, took control of the temple in Jerusalem, which he dedicated to the god Jupiter, turned it into a Greek-style gymnasia, even erected a statue of himself inside the temple. He outlawed circumcision, established cult prostitution in the temple, and specifically sacrificed unclean animals there, such as pigs, in the temple. And he forced Jews to worship him as their god upon pain of death. And by the way, Antiochus was merciless against anyone in his entire realm, not just Jews, who refused to Hellenize and to worship him. And after the initial horror and assault, how do you think the Jews of Judea reacted to those changes made by Antiochus? How did the Jews of Judea react? In the main, for the most part, a large portion of the Jewish population of Judea was just as happy to wear Greek garments, to wrestle naked inside the temple, and to embrace Hellenistic culture. Just as many modern Jews embrace the Western culture of today to the extent that they virtually abandon the Jewish tradition and Jewish styles of life. So too did this happen in the second century BCE under Antiochus IV. As it happened to the Jewish exiles in Babylonia in the sixth century BCE. It's a constant theme of Jewish life that when Jews are free to assimilate, many do just that. And I'm not equating what American Jewry is today to what the Jews of the second century in Judea were doing when they embraced Hellenism. But there are some similarities. And there are similarities which should just give us pause as we try to think through who we are as Jews today. Anyway, there was a Jewish leader in the Jewish town of Modi'in. And Modi'in is about 19 miles west of Jerusalem, a city which, by the way, still exists and is a flourishing Israeli community today. But there was a Jewish leader in Modi'in, the priest of Modi'in, named Mattathias, or Mattathiahu. And Mattathias had five sons, Simon or Simeon, Eliezer. There was John, known as Yochanan. There was Jonathan, Yehonatan. And there was Judah, Yehuda. And in the year 167 BCE, in the town of Modi'in, Syrian soldiers gathered at the town altar. And they tried to force a Jew to sacrifice a pig on the altar. And when the Jew, when the Jew did so, 
Mattathias took a sword out of a Syrian scabbard, slew the soldier and the Jew who had sacrificed the pig, and he turned to the crowd and proclaimed, Every one of you who is zealous for the law and wishes to maintain the covenant of Adonai, follow me. And Mattathias and his five sons rushed into the hills, and a few Jews followed. It's always a few Jews who follow. And from then on, under the leadership of Judah, who turned out to be a genius of a general and a warrior, and was given the name Maccabee, which is normally translated as the hammer for his fighting power. Judah the hammer, Yehuda Maccabee. Though there's also a tradition that the word Maccabee is an acronym for the phrase from the Torah, Micha Mocha Ma'ilim Adonai, a phrase which is translated to be, who is like unto thee among the mighty, O Lord, or Adonai. But whatever, under Judah's leadership, a small band of Jews began a quixotic journey to defeat what was then the mightiest military empire of its time, the Seleucid Syrian Empire. And Judah and his army, known as the Maccabees, fought what we would call a guerrilla war. They knew the land like the back of their hands. They hid in caves during the day. They struck Syrian military outposts at night, drove the Syrians crazy. And then over time, Antiochus's generals sent their tanks into Judea. What were the tanks of the day? Elephants carrying soldiers who were archers, bows and arrows, to fight against the Jews. They, the Syrians would sit on top of the, the um, elephants and would fire arrows down at the Maccabees. And there were heroic stories of Maccabees who would risk their lives or even sacrifice their lives by running under the elephants and pushing a sword into the elephant's soft underbelly, the only vulnerable spot on an elephant, to bring the elephant crashing to earth, sometimes falling on the Maccabee himself. And tradition has that Judah's brother Eliezer died in such a fashion. And as the Maccabees continue to fight, a group of more observant Jews called at the time the Hasidim, the pious ones, the Hasidim, they gave the Maccabees their seal of approval. And when that happened, the Maccabees began to have greater and greater popular support. More and more Jews joined the Maccabees. And in the end, the truth is Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, had bigger fish to fry, bigger problems on his plate. And he finally said to his generals, we're wasting time and effort and soldiers in the fight against the Maccabees. It's time to redeploy. And the Maccabees, a small band of courageous, committed Jews who believed they had the right to their own self-identity, their own ethnic identity, and a Jewish way of life, actually defeated the mighty Syrian army around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Maccabees won back the Temple Mount. By the way, for many Jews, that's where the story ends, with the Maccabees reclaiming the Temple. In actuality, the Maccabees still had to fight throughout the rest of Judea, and the war continued for many years. And wherever Judah was victorious, especially at the beginning, he would bring Jews back to the safety of Jerusalem. And after seven years of fighting, Judah was actually killed in battle. Judah died in battle. And he was succeeded by his brother, Yochanan, who was then captured by the Syrians and executed. Yochanan was succeeded by his brother, Yehonatan, who ultimately made peace with Syria in 157 BCE. But Jehonatan is still killed 12 years later by a Syrian king who fears another Jewish revolt. And it's not until the year 141 BCE, 26 years after Mattathias and Judah began the Jewish revolt against Syria, that Syria 
finally made a formal peace with Judah's last brother, Simeon. And the Maccabees establish a monarchy of their own called the Hasmonean Dynasty, which is granted full independence by Rome in 139 BCE, and this marks the only time in Jewish history that the Jews had sovereignty over the land of Eretz Yisrael from the time of the Babylonian exile in 586 BCE until Rome takes independence away from the Hasmonean dynasty in the year 40 CE. And then 30 years later, it will sack the city of Jerusalem and Rome will destroy the second temple in the year 70. But it's important to understand that the Maccabees establish a monarchy known as the Hasmonean dynasty. And incidentally, one of the explanations for why the book of Maccabees is not included in the Bible, in the Kituvim, the writings, is that when the Jewish people went to put together, when the rabbis put together, canonized the books of the Bible, it was under Roman control. The Jews were under Roman control. And the Jews felt it was not politic to put into their Bible a story of the defeat of the group that would one day ultimately become the Roman Empire. And the other reason why people and historians believe Hanukkah is not in the Bible is the Hasmonean dynasty. The Bible itself, the Jewish Bible, is all about the monarchy of King David, who according to Jewish tradition will ultimately, the Messiah will ultimately come from King David. So the Bible is all about the monarchy and the kingship of King David and then Solomon, etc. And that the rabbis did not want to confuse the issue by putting another monarchy, the Hasmonean monarchy, into the Jewish Bible. But that's the history of the Maccabees and their fight against the Syrian Empire. A fight in which the real miracle of the events is that a small group of committed Jews believed so passionately and deeply in their right to live as free Jews, that they were able to defeat the great Syrian army and ultimately gain total independence for the Jewish people. And as I said, the story of Hanukkah is one of the great heroic human stories of all time, a story that establishes the right of minority cultures to retain their own identities and traditions and ways of life when the majority culture may be of some other tradition. And when the United States of America established the Bill of Rights, and one of which is freedom of religion, and the principle that the majority has no right to establish a state religion, don't miss the significance of this amazing, liberating principle. Namely, the majority does not have the right to impose its own ethnicity, or culture, or religious traditions, beliefs, and practices upon any minority group within this great country of ours. There's no greater reason why Jews have been so welcomed in America, have thrived in America, than this reason, that the majority which has obviously been Christian. The majority understands that even though it is in the majority, minorities such as Jews have the right, the constitutional right, the inalienable right to their own ethnicity and traditions. This was the lesson which the Maccabees fought for and died for and taught the world. And by the way, and I want to talk to you for a moment about the sociology of American Jewish life. It's ironic that at this season of Hanukkah, which celebrates the principles of ethnic and religious independence, of not succumbing to the majority in terms of the way one lives life, not to their religious traditions or their beliefs, it's ironic that this is the season many American Jews find it most difficult to refrain 
from Christian expressions of the holiday season. This is the season when many Jews wish they were able to participate in the American Christian holiday of Christmas. And you'll often hear the argument, Christmas isn't a religious holiday anymore. It's, it's been secularized. It's been commercialized. It's an American holiday. A holiday of good cheer, of presents, colored lights, decorated trees, stockings full of presents. Wonderful, wonderful music and songs. And did that Jew, Irving Berlin, know how to write a song? I mean, I'm in Hallmark buying birthday cards and Hanukkah cards. And throughout the store, I hear Bing Crosby and Nat King Cole singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, or I'll be home for Christmas. And the tears are just streaming down my face. I mean, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel is cute. But can you top chestnuts roasting by an open fire? And it's no wonder that many Jews wish they could really be part of a Christmas celebration. And for a while there was the, the Hanukkah bush as a Christmas tree alternative, though everyone understood it was a Christmas bush. And when Jews tell me they simply think a decorated tree is pretty, my response is, you're right. Have one in your home in March. No, 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 not March, December. We all understand why. Christmas is beautiful. And no Jew should be afraid of acknowledging Christmas is beautiful. But it's not Jewish. It's beautiful, but it's not ours. Other people are entitled to their beautiful things, their beautiful holidays, their beautiful music. And we as Jews can appreciate all of it so long as we know it isn't ours. And am I critical of a Jew who visits Christian friends at Christmas time, who may help decorate a neighbor's tree, might be invited to be there when the presents are opened, may even receive a Christmas present? I am not in the least critical, so long as the Jew gives in return a Hanukkah present, even under the tree, a Hanukkah present. For Christmas is a Christian holiday, celebrating from a Christian's perspective the birth of their Messiah, who was actually sent by God to save all humanity. And to say that Christmas is an American holiday, that it's now so commercialized, it's void of religious significance, is to insult Christians everywhere and to trivialize all those Christians who attend Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve to welcome the birth, to celebrate the birth of their Savior. Christmas is beautiful. The Christmas spirit is wonderful. It should last all year long. Rockefeller Center is magic at Christmas time. Barbara Streisand singing Silent Night is a real religious experience. Except that when Barbara Streisand sang Silent Night in Central Park, it was on a warm summer's night. Any Jew may say, Christmas is beautiful. It's just not mine. And in any Jewish home where parents are striving to create a holistic sense of Jewish identity for themselves and their children. Parents have to understand that Christmas does not belong in a Jewish home. And I know there are many who watch Jewish 101, you may be watching right now, who, who are in mixed marriages, where one spouse may be Jewish and the other spouse may be Christian. And I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. Every family has to determine the styles that work best for them. But I am saying that if there are parents who are striving to create a sense of Jewish identity for their homes and for their children and for themselves, then in such a family, it's better not to bring Christmas into the home. And if need be, 
one needs to find ways of participating in the holiday through the homes of others for whom Christmas is an authentic expression of their own identities. And I say all this in the context of the meaning of the Maccabee struggle and what they truly fought for and the real miracle of Hanukkah, which we celebrate, we celebrate at this season. How strong the surge within the human heart and mind is to retain one's own sense of particularism, particular identity, especially when one is in the minority. And so finally we get back to Judah and the Hasidim, who found they had reconquered the Temple Mount from Antiochus and the Syrians, and they cleansed the Temple of all idolatry, and we established it as Adonai's home on earth. That is what Hanukkah is about. Jewish strength reclaiming Jewish self-identity. Now the Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah. That's how the holiday gets its name, from the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees in the year 164 BCE. And in that year, the Maccabees had been unable earlier to celebrate the eight-day holiday of Sukkot. They were forbidden from celebrating Sukkot, which happened to be the very holiday upon which King Solomon had dedicated the first temple in Jerusalem when he dedicated the temple. And so the Maccabees decided to call Hanukkah their second Sukkot. And just as Solomon had done, the Maccabees celebrated for eight nights and eight days, a la Sukkot. That's the history of Hanukkah and why we celebrate the holiday for eight nights and eight days. But there's also the beautiful story, legend of Hanukkah, told to delight both child and adult alike. How when it came time to rekindle the seven-branched menorah in the temple, a menorah which is never to stop burning, a symbol of God's eternal presence, the story goes that the Maccabees could only find enough pure olive oil to light the menorah for one day. Well, it would take eight days for new olive oil to be brought to Jerusalem from the north. But the Maccabees decided it was important to light the menorah even for one night. And so they did. And then, lo and behold, the one night's worth of oil burned not for one night, but miraculously for all eight nights until the new oil could arrive. And whether one understands this story to be a beautiful legend, or whether one believes the story recounts a miracle, the truth of Hanukkah remains eternal. The truth of triumph, of human will, of human conviction, of human understanding and commitment that testifies to the sanctity and dignity of every human being and of the Jewish commitment to a tradition that has transcended every possible brutality to shine as brightly today as it did for the Maccabees nearly 2,200 years ago at this season. So how do Jews celebrate Hanukkah? And the answer is with a menorah, a candelabra called the Hanukkah. And here you can see on this table a number of menorahs. Uh, this here is a very traditional looking menorah, but it's actually a Hanukkah. A menorah tends to have seven branches celebrating Shabbat. And the Hanukkah menorah has nine places for candles, and that's why it's called a Hanukkah. And it's hard to see this at the moment, but I'm going to show you. We're going to take this and move it a little bit this way so you give a little bit of depth. This right here is the shamash. The shamash is used to light the other candles. 
and in every menorah the shamash is removable. So if we pull back and see the entire Hanukkiah menorah, you can see here that I have a shamash in my hand, and one lights the shamash first, and then uses the light from the shamash, the flame from the shamash, to light the candles on the Hanukkiah. And what I've done here is I've put all eight candles into the Hanukkiah, and I want you to imagine you are facing the menorah, the Hanukkiah, and I'm standing behind it. And I'm going to now turn a little bit this way. Hopefully the candles will not fall out. So now pretend you are facing the menorah of the Hanukkiah, and interestingly enough, and I'll show you this here, if I were in front of the, the menorah, we would put the candles in and we'd start one night, two nights, three nights, four nights. So the candles are placed in the Hanukkiah from right to left. And the one on the left always represents the candle for the night we are celebrating. So if we were celebrating, for example, two nights of Hanukkah, only the first two candles would be in the menorah. On the third night, we had the third candle, fourth night, the fourth candle, until the eighth night would have all eight candles, and one always begins by lighting the candle that represents the night we are celebrating, and then we move backwards from left to right. So the candles are placed in the Hanukkiah from right to left, but they're lit from left to right. And on the one hand, there is no menorah police that will come to your house and say, wait a minute, you put the candles in the wrong or you, you lit them in the wrong order. But for those of you who care, that's the way the tradition suggests. We always build up toward the night we're celebrating and we always begin by lighting the candle which represents the night we're celebrating in honor of that night and then work backwards. And then there's one other thing that you should just know. This is personal for me. It's it, it somehow... It drives me crazy sometimes, so I'm going to tell you about it, but you can decide whether it's important to you or not. The Jewish tradition says that every candle of the Hanukkiah, the menorah, is to be lit by the shamash. Shamash means caretaker. There's a shamash in a synagogue sometimes. And very often, you put the candles in the menorah, inevitably, some candle goes out, some can the candle falls, and there's a tendency to take the candle that has fallen and to pick it up and to light it from an adjacent candle, not from the shamash. Now I say again, there's no Hanukkah police. No one's going to come screaming to your home, how dare you light a Hanukkah candle from another Hanukkah candle. But there is something beautiful about the integrity of the Hanukkah candles. And the tradition says, they're only to be lit by the shamash. A candle falls, a candle goes out, you put the candle back, you take the shamash again, and you relight it. You never light another Hanukkah candle with another Hanukkah candle, only the shamash. I offer it to you, if it makes sense to you, you'll do it. Um, and again, whenever I see somebody, I just was like, ah, stop. Use the shamash, that's what it's there for. So the Hanukkah, and uh, let's go back to the table. The Hanukkiah has eight candles for all the eight nights. We light them in this direction. And there's always a shamash, which is used to light the other candles. And when I was growing up, basically, this was the style of menorah or Hanukkiah that I always saw. But the reality is that there can be many forms of Hanukkiah. In fact, if you go to the Diaspora Museum in Jerusalem, you will see over the course of history the Jewish people built their menorahs in every conceivable shape. Now, here's one that is so interesting because it represents, this was given to me as a gift by a very special man I love, who works here at Shalom TV, Serge Goldberg, knows that I am a baseball fanatic. And so Serge Goldberg, I'll, I'll try to pick this up. Serge Goldberg bought me, for this Hanukkah, a baseball theme. Uh, there goes the candle. A baseball-themed menorah. And so 
there is always the shamash, which tends to be higher than the other cam candles. Can you come in on this? We'll pick it up in a minute. But there's this baseball that has the shamash in it. And the shamash is used to light the other candles. Um, in this bat that you see, there are holes and I'm sorry, not in the bat, in the uh, baseballs in front of the bat. There is holes, and you just put the candles in. And this would be for the second night of Hanukkah, as you face the Hanukkah, the menorah. And we would take the shamash from the big baseball. We would light the shamash with a flame. And then we would come and light the second candle, and then the first candle. And we put the shamash back for the second night. And here's another Hanukkah, another menorah, and again, they can be any shape at all, and this one represents people singing and rejoicing in my mind at the Western Wall on the holiday of Hanukkah, and here I've set it up for one night, the first night of Hanukkah, here is the shamash, thank you Igor, the shamash, and on the first night we would simply take the candle and light the first candle of Hanukkah, and then put the shamash back. And then on all succeeding nights, we would simply add a candle, whoops, add a candle from uh, right to left and light them from left to right. By the way, in many homes, there are many Hanukkiahs, many different menorahs, and each person lights his own menorah, or the family gets together and Different members of the family light different candles in the same Hanukkah, the same menorah. There are all kinds of individual family traditions. And on every night of Hanukkah, there are two blessings that we recite as we light the Hanukkah candles. Two blessings. The first blessing blesses the holiday of Hanukkah. And the second blessing is thankful for the miracles that were made for our ancestors at this season many years ago. And the two blessings go as follows. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddeshanu B'mitzvotav B'tzivanu Lahadlik Ner Shel Chanukah Blessed art thou, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who has made us holy with his commandments and has commanded us to kindle the lights of Chanukah. And the second blessing goes, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam She'asa Nisim L'Avotenu Bayamim Haheim Bazman Hazeh Blessed art thou, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who made miracles for our ancestors in those days at this season. And the melody is one you may have heard very often Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddeshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'hadlik Ner Shel Chanukah the second blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Aulam She'asa Nisim Lavoteinu Bayamim Ahem Bazman and on the first night of Hanukkah, as is often true on the first night of holidays, there is one more additional blessing said only on the first night, and that blessing is called the Shehechianu. And the Shehechianu is recited on all happy, joyous occasions. And it goes, Baruch HaTah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehecheyanu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. Blessed art thou, and our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life, sustained us, 
and enabled us to reach this joyous season. And the Shekhiano goes like this. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shekhiano Vekiemanu Vehigianu Lazman Amen. And different families had different melodies. There's no melody given at Mount Sinai. Any melody that you've grown up with is the right melody for any of these blessings or songs. But the idea is that a family sings them together. Recites blessings to remember the specialness of the holiday, the specialness of the meaning of Hanukkah. And after the candles are lit, whether it's the first night or the eighth night, songs are sung, Ma'utsur, normally translated Rock of Ages, Ma'utsur Yeshuati, or Mi Yimalel, Mi Yimalel, Vurot Yisrael, Otan Mi Yimne. Who can we call? Who can we tell? The things that befell us, who can tell us? Or, I had a little dreidel, I made it out of clay, and when it's dry and ready, oh dreidel, I shall play dreidel. Now dreidel. And by the way, let's see, Igor, let me, you can see the letters on the four corners of the dreidel. Each letter represents another word, beginning with the letter nun, which stands for Ness, miracle. The gimel is for gadol, great or big. The third letter is the hey, which represents the word haya, was, although very often you'll hear it translated as happened. And the fourth letter is the Hebrew letter shin, which stands for the word sham, which means there, as in the word over there. So it's nase, gadol, haya, sham, a great, Miracle, this gadol, miracle great. Haya happened there. Where? In Judea, where Judah the Maccabees and the Hasidim and all those who followed them were able to defeat the mighty Syrian Empire. And again, the legend of the Hanukkah light, the menorah burning for eight nights on one night's worth of oil. And uh, we spin the, the dreidel. By the way, we have other dreidels here. This is a blue dreidel, and the letters are still there. In fact, on this dreidel, they actually put the words, Nes Gadol, Haya, and uh, Sham, there we go. Let's spin the red one. Uh, stay with me, Igor, here we go. And there you see the dreidel spinning, and it will fall on one of its letters. And many families play that however the dreidel falls and whatever letter is facing up tells you what you've won. Some people use candy coins. Some people use pennies. I don't know, maybe in your house you use, you know, $50 bills, whatever it is. But there's a pot, peanuts, toothpicks. And if you get a nun, you get nothing. If you get a gimel, you get everything. If you get a hay, you get half the pot. And if you get a shin, depending on how serious dreidel players you are in your home, you either match the pot, or you at least put one of whatever you're playing with into the pot, and the next person spins. And we also developed a dreidel game many of you may play. It's a, a, a dreidel relay race. And let's say there are four people on each side. The first person spins the dreidel, and the second person has his own dreidel ready to spin. And when the first dreidel drops, the second person on the team spins, and the team with the dreidel spinning the longest after, for example, four people on each team spin, whichever team still is spinning the dreidel when the other team's fourth dreidel drops, they win. That's the dreidel relay game, a great way of getting many people involved in a dreidel game all together. And that was created by a friend of mine named Bob Erickson 
who basically isn't involved in Jewish observance, but when it came to dreidels, he came up with the dreidel relay game, a very Jewish type of thing to have happen. Anyway, that's the dreidel, and the dreidel is also played on the night of Hanukkah. But then again, there's one more very important custom for the holiday of Hanukkah. Presents. Hanukkah is about giving young people, especially children, presents. And if there are any of you who say, well, isn't that sort of, you know, a Christmas type of thing done on Hanukkah? The answer is no. In Eastern Europe, every night of Hanukkah, they would give their children something called Hanukkah gelt. Gelt is a Yiddish word for money. And Hanukkah gelt was given every night of Hanukkah, all eight nights. You gave your children a present. Now, in America, Jews tend to do everything bigger, maybe better. And so we give our children all kinds of presents. But I am of the conviction that a child should get at least something, even if it's just some gelt, a quarter, a dollar, five dollars, whatever, depending on the age of the child. A child should get something all eight nights of Hanukkah. And, you know, families, again, do it their way. Some give a nice present each of the eight nights. Some families reserve the first and eighth night for the big presents. And during the intermediate six nights, they give a small present or, again, a cash gift of gelt. But Hanukkah is, to the delight of children, a time to receive presents, even if there were no Christmas. So here are just some Hanukkah presents that we have to give out to our staff later this month. And if you've celebrated Hanukkah, you also know that there is something called Hanukkah Gelt, which is chocolate coins that are given to young people to celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah. And you, know, you can go to a store and buy bags of coins individually, or you can get actually boxes of coins, depending on how many people are going to be celebrating Hanukkah with you and at your house. And there's always food. Jews always eat. The first thing we did before we left Egypt is to eat. The night we became Jews, before we left Egypt, we were told to eat. Nothing happens in Jewish life without eating. In America, Eastern European tradition tells us we should eat potato pancakes called latkes. Latkes, potato pancakes. Some eat it with applesauce, some eat it with sour cream. In America, Jews have found even more exotic ways to spice up their latkes. By the way, in Israel, they eat something called sufganiyot, jelly donuts, delicious. So many Jews in America now eat latkes and jelly donuts on Hanukkah. And according to the Jewish tradition, the menorah or Hanukkah is placed in the home in the window so all passers-by can see. This is a Jewish tradition that precedes Jews coming to America. You put the menorah in the window to show that there's a Jewish family in the home who understands the miracles of Hanukkah, legendary and historical. And the Jewish people's communal commitment to a world in which no Antiochus anywhere on earth will ever extinguish the divine light that burns within the soul of every child, woman, and man who walks this beautiful, divine earth. Finally, for me, and I believe for many others, there's one more element to Hanukkah. In my Chavurah, my congregation, we celebrate Hanukkah with every family bringing a Hanukkah, their menorah, to a congregational menorah lighting. And when every menorah has been lit on this long table covered with tin foil, we shouldn't create a fire. And all the lights of the room are out. 
all the children come to stand by age in back of the table. Their beautiful faces aglow as they behold all the candles burning before them. And for all the parents and adults present, and grandparents, what we're looking at is our Jewish future, our children standing together in the light of Hanukkah. And then at this moment, as we behold our Jewish future, we also pause to recall all those Maccabees throughout Jewish history, especially the modern Maccabees, the men and women who have defended both the state of Israel and indeed, as Entebbe showed us all, the entire Jewish people all over the world, the people of the state of Israel. And at that moment, together, we recite the Mourner's Kaddish in honor and memory of all who've died, Al Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying the name of God throughout Jewish history. The Maccabees of yore, the Maccabees of today, and all those who died, Al Kiddush Hashem, in the flame of the Shoah. And then we sing Hatikva, the national anthem of not only the state of Israel, but the Jewish people, understanding that we are today, free, proud Jews in large measure because of those who have come before us, who gave everything they had and believed in so that we can now stand at the menorah this year to celebrate Jewish freedom and Jewish life and the reality of a Jewish state of Israel. For any of you who have family members who've made supreme sacrifices, especially the sacrifice of life, for our sake, for the sake of the Jewish people, indeed for the sake of humanity. This is a day when you and your loved ones are remembered for good by all of us. And this too is the message of Hanukkah. I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends, and have a wonderful Hanukkah holiday.